meet him for the first time yesterday after we invited him, and he's been a great guest, a good guy to know. Those of you who got to meet him, uh, I'm sure you've had good interaction with him. So if you have any questions, I'm sure he'd entertain any email or tweet or blog or whatever. But uh, <laughs> Seth, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that introduction. Uh, so I'm just going to hop right into it, although I am going to hop right out of it because I catch a flight immediately after this. So um, I can hopefully get this done in a time frame where we can take questions. And then Eric's going to rush me out, I think. So let me get right to it. Uh, I want to start with this uh, intellectual uh, question or topic, which is, if you're a virologist, you tend to appreciate that there are viruses of archaea, viruses of bacteria, and viruses of eukaryotes. Just as if there's three cellular domains of life, there are really three types of viruses, and each are specific to those cellular domains of life. We know of no case where a virus has traversed more than one cellular domain of life, and I think that's a question worthy of our attention, but rarely asked in virology, which is why has no extant virus done the business of crossing and infecting more than one cell type. Because it would be a profound evolutionary advantage if a virus could infect multiple cellular domains. But for that profound advantage, there must be profound costs as well for a virus to be able to do that. And we know that viruses are often very specific to their hosts, even within a bacterial genus, perhaps even species, right? So the specificity issues really come down to cell entry, uh, so cell entry is a general property of viruses, right? Uh, this is not a comprehensive description of cell entry, but it roughly polarizes the, the biology here, which is, oops, which is that bacterial viruses or bacteriophages uh, are going to use some kind of injection method, attachment to the cell, inject your DNA to get in. Uh, viruses uh, will tend to use uh, fusion processes where the envelope around the virus will fuse to the eukaryotic membrane. Um, and this is often mediated by various eukaryotic peptidases or proteins uh, to get the virus in. Now, the other issue for specificity, again, not a completely polarizing position here, but a general property, is that bacteriophages undergo some kind of lysis where they break open the cell. And this is often accomplished, if you're familiar with Rye Young's work, with a set of enzymes such as lysozymes, holins, and spanins. In the eukaryotic world, we have a range of possibilities for how viruses might exit, including budding uh, by grabbing a piece of the cell membrane and budding off, um, exocytosis, uh, apoptosis, which may be considered something similar to the way bacteriophages lyse, but of course the, the machinery, the genetic machinery to do this is quite different um, in other forms as well. Okay. The third reason for why you aren't, we're not going to see viruses that transcend more than one cellular domain of life is the coevolutionary arms race that happens between viruses and host. So a series of adaptations and counteradaptations categorized by antagonistic coevolution, as well as evasion of the host immune response, will set up very specific scenarios where the phages or viruses might become really good at evading the counteradaptations of one type of host cell, but certainly not taking on any evolutionary routes to trump multiple cellular domains of life. So this is a starting conceptual framework for a problem that we've been thinking about where we think we can make somewhat of an inroad into thinking about how could a virus potentially do this? Because we study viruses in the symbiotic virus sphere, which is not a very common place to study uh, viruses. Normally we think about phages in the free living world where there's rampant horizontal gene transfer between different types of bacteria. In the obligate intracellular world, we have bacterial cells that live inside eukaryotic cells. And the picture I'm showing you here on the left is a cell culture, a monolayer of insect cells labeled in blue for their DNA. And then in pink is the Wolbachia bacteria that live in the cytoplasm of these cells and they're obligate intracellular bacteria. If you zoom in from those cells and do a transmission electron mic micrograph, you'll see something rather uninteresting. Right? This is the Wolbachia cell. It's about one micron in length. It has multiple membranes around it. Um, so it should have its own inner and outer membrane, and then the extra membranes around it are eukaryotic-derived membranes. Right? So sometimes we'll see Wolbachia cells with one outer membrane, one inner membrane, and one eukaryotic membrane. Other times we'll see multiple eukaryotic membranes like this. 
So if you're a virus that's going to live in this kind of niche, you essentially have what we're thinking of as a two-fold cell challenge. Um, you have to not only break open and lyse the bacterial inner and outer membranes and peptidoglycan, but you also have to do this uh, with eukaryotic-derived encapsulating membranes. So we're not, I just want to be clear here, we're not going to propose that a virus of Wolbachia infects the eukaryotic genome. What we're thinking about here is how does it traverse the multiple cells to ultimately infect the bacterial target, right? So our host, or our model system is called Wolbachia. It is one of the greatest pandemics in the history of life from a biodiversity perspective. So this is uh, a picture of an insect egg from our lab. It's actually of this Nasonia parasitic wasps shown here. The DNA of the host are stained in blue again. The Wolbachia are stained in green. And you'll notice that the Wolbachia are polarized towards the posterior end of this embryo. And this is an embryo that was laid just a few minutes ago. And essentially, it's already got a cocktail of bacteria provisioned from the mother's ovaries directly into the developing eggs. Okay? So these are maternally transmitted Wolbachia. Um, they occur in up to 66% of all arthropod species, which comprise 85% of all animal species. They are what's known as reproductive parasites, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about in a second. And they're, they're widely recognized as speciation agents in insects. And Wolbachia are also used for mosquito vector control as well. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. Wolbachia also occur in nematodes. Uh, nematodes are, are particularly the filarial nematodes, which are infectious to mammals, such as dogs and humans. In this case, the Wolbachia are mutualistic and required for oogenesis and larval development of the filarial nematodes. And they are considered targets for curing human disease because if you get rid of the mutualistic Wolbachia with an antibiotic or a phage lysin, for example, uh, you will essentially cause infertility and uh, lead to a lower production of these filarial nematodes in the host. You can also suspend uh, larval development of these as well. Finally, uh, as I mentioned, while not a direct host, um, what happens with the filarial nematodes is they get into the human body, and the Wolbachia are in the hypodermis of the filarial nematodes, and they're actually secreted by the filarial nematodes. Now the Wolbachia gets into the human system. Now, they don't appear to persist for much longer than three days, but there's a continuous shedding of the Wolbachia from the nematodes into the human body. This leads to an, an inflammation response, which ultimately gives us these two major diseases, river blindness and lymphatic filariasis. Uh, for a while, this disease has been studied as principally a filarial disease. In fact, it's more complicated than that. Wolbachia are actually the primary reason for why these disease symptoms develop, because they're inflammatory responses that become a chronic illness. So if you can get rid of Wolbachia, you can actually get rid of the disease. That's the idea that Gates Foundation is putting millions and millions of dollars into to try and find small molecules that target Wolbachia specifically. It's also a reason why we study the bacteriophage, because potentially we have a natural weapon of Wolbachia that can be used in this fight. So here's a little bit more in Wolbachia and nematodes with a gratuitously cute picture of a puppy. Because if you have, uh, if you have any experience with puppies, you might know about dog heartworm. And in fact, these are filarial nematodes carrying around Wolbachia. And one of the treatments that vets are now prescribing, although it's not universal, is to just give them doxycycline or tetracycline to get rid of the Wolbachia, which in turn helps get rid of the, the worms. Right? Uh, I showed you a picture of river blindness. This is an individual with lymphatic filariasis, which is just a massive, massive swelling of the lymph nodes. And remember, Wolbachia is really at the culprit of, of these diseases and potentially cures. In arthropods, I mentioned that Wolbachia is a reproductive parasite. So what is reproductive parasitism? You may have not heard that term until today. This is essentially distortions by the bacteria that lead to more infected female offspring than the host would otherwise produce. So in mushroom feeding flies, we have male killing, where male embryos are specifically killed, female embryos are allowed to live. Uh, parthenogenesis occurs in many species of haplodiploid wasps, where haploid eggs in the mother, if she's unfertilized, Wolbachia will convert the chromosomes of those haploid eggs, cause an endoduplication event, making that egg now diploid. And in a haplodiploid system, diploid eggs become female, so no sperm, no, no males are required. Wolbachia takes over the sexual reproduction and makes an all-female population and says, thank you very much. 
Feminization is the conversion of genetic males into morphological and functional females. So it's exactly what it sounds like. So why would Wabakia do all this? It's maternally transmitted. So if it makes more infected females in the host population, it's increasing its own fitness in the next generation. Uh, so not all maternally transmitted organisms are destined for beneficial interactions. You can imagine that even their selection on mitochondria or chloroplasts to do this kind of thing. Mitochondria and plants cause cytoplasmic male sterility, essentially another form of selection on cytoplasmic elements to increase the fitness of their transmitting sex, the females. So this is a project now launched all over the world, starting in Australia with Scott O'Neill's group. It's called the Eliminate Dengue Project because Wolbachia confer anti-dengue or antiviral resistance to mosquitoes. And the idea is, is if we release a whole bunch of Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes, they will become recalcitrant to carrying dengue virus. And this could be a very cheap and effective way of preventing dengue from spreading uh, from mosquitoes to humans. Uh, there are trials ongoing. Uh, uh, they're well into the development stage. They think this is going to work. It's now in China. It's now in Brazil. It's now in Taiwan. Um, and the list is growing every day now. So we do have a program where lots of Wolbachia infected mosquitoes from the lab are being released into the field for this kind of control. And the communities have to consent to the release of these mosquitoes, and they do it enthusiastically. So where does our work come in? Well, what we are studying here are parasitic wasps of the genus Nasonia. Um, this is a picture of a male and a female. Males on top courting a female. Uh, within the females and the male's gonads, so testes and ovaries, in this case I'm showing you testes, we have a Wolbachia population that specializes on infecting the cells of reproductive tissues. So in red, are Wolbachia, and in blue are the host cells, and you're looking at the two testes and an accessory gland that accompanies those testes, and you'll see that the Wolbachia are just populating that, those testes, in part to modify reproduction for reproductive parasitism, and then for the females, Wolbachia is obviously passed on maternally from ovaries to the eggs. If you take some slices, do some electron micrographs, um, sometimes you'll see very artsy, beautiful cells of Wolbachia um, these are just perfect in size. Um, they tend to have the minimal number of membranes of three membranes around them, and there's really no phage activity going on here. But that's not always the case. About 11% of the time when we do these micrographs and look for things, we find phages or phage activity inside the Wolbachia cells. So this is work done a while ago by Michelle Marshall, who is a former technician in my lab. And you know, this was the first time she had done transmission electron mic micrography and just hit it out of the park. So here's a Wolbachia cell. It has about 60 tiny bacteriophage particles inside of it. And if you blow it up, the phage particles look, have a standard structure of icosahedral shapes, tails, etc. Um, this is uh, an infected and uninfected Wolbachia adjacent to each other. So what you're looking at here is a uninfected phage or, or uninfected Wolbachia that doesn't have lytic phage, and just above it is a Wolbachia cell that has lytic phage at the top corner right here. And interestingly, in this case, the Wolbachia has this pycnotic-like patch of DNA that's degrading, and an inner membrane, bacterial membrane, that has collapsed from the outside and is coming inside. This is typical of bacteriophage lysis as the phages move out and or in to out. Here is a, a Wolbachia cell in which all the bacteriophages are polarized towards the top end of the Wolbachia cell. And you can imagine that there should be a membrane about right here, but it's not there. The cell is essentially broken open, and the phages appear to be exiting this particular cell. Now, once they exit the Wolbachia cell, in this case we were looking in testes, we'll tend to see those phage particles of similar size, at least, traveling around the testes uh, tissue matrix. So this is a packet of similarly sized particles that we think are the bacteriophage now moving around the eukaryotic environment. So what's important here is the phages get out, the phages are now in the eukaryotic environment, and in theory uh, they are looking for, if you will, other Wolbachia cells to infect. They've also got to evade the eukaryotic immune response um, as these phage particles traverse that eukaryotic tissue. Why is that interesting to begin with? 
Well, from a genome evolution perspective, phages and symbionts are not very common. Right? So as you shrink your genome, you have fewer genes, you tend to lose mobile genetic elements like transposons, plasmids, and bacteriophages. And free-living bacteria up here tend to be chock full of this stuff, right? This is the open source evolution part of the, of the bacterial world that's largely missing in small genomes of intracellular bacteria. Clearly, Wolbachius bucked that trend. And so in 2004, when the genome was published for Wolbachia and other genomes came online, there's an upper estimate now of 20% of the Wolbachia genome being populated by <laughs> bacteriophages transposon genes. So even though it's small, it looks a lot like a free-living bacterial genome in terms of the dynamic elements. So this set us on a course to understand this further. So how are phages even transmitted in obligate intracellular bacteria? We've got this two-fold cell challenge. It's got to get into the obligate intracellular bacteria. It's also got to get into the host that houses that obligate intracellular bacteria. So one of the early ways we were thinking about this was what we've called the intracellular arena concept. Essentially, animal co-infections facilitate transfer of bacteriophages or other DNA between intracellular bacteria. So if you have a whole bunch of arthropod hosts that are potentially Wolbachia infected, and you zoom in on a cell, it turns out that every so often you find Wolbachia infections that are existing with another infection. So among Wolbachia infected insects, one third of all those insects carry co-infections of multiple Wolbachia. So now we've got a possibility for phages to move between these two different co-infections. And it's not just that. Facultative intracellular bacteria can also come into the cellular niche and source the mobile elements for which Wolbachia then picks up, and then that may exchange with other co-infections of Wolbachia. So what we tend to think of as a closed niche in the intracellular world for bacteria can be a slightly open niche, and we set out to test these kinds of things. So the first thing we did was ask, is there horizontal transfer of the phage at all? Does it move laterally in the predicted way, or is it inherited vertically from one cell to the next to the next? So if you look at Wolbachia's phylogeny, uh, most of the phages tend to occur in this A and B subgroups, which diverged about 60 million years ago. And the host name for these A and B strains are listed in the phylogeny. So we'll back you from Drosophila, et cetera. Now, if you make a clone library of phage genes and then do a phylogeny of all the haplotypes you get from these particular phages, what you see is a smorgasbord of phage haplotypes. And I've color-coded them from whether they were derived from a B Wolbachia or an A Wolbachia. So because there's a complete mashup of the A and B phages, if you will, right, phages derived from the A and B Wolbachia, uh, this looks like there's rampant horizontal transfer of phage WO, so what we call it for Wolbachia, between A and B Wolbachia. Okay. So the phylogenetic evidence was uh, based on these global uh, diversity analyses. We thought we could test it a little bit further by looking explicitly at co-infections where we could rare insects in the lab that are known to have both A and B Wolbachia. At least one of these has a phage. And the idea is that within that intracellular arena, there should be phage exchange from the donor to the recipient, giving us now infections that have both uh, different Wolbachia but the same phage. We can PCR clone sequence that. And the prediction is that if different Wolbachia have the same phage genes, then there's lateral transfer. So, this has now been done for at least five insects. Uh, we've done the top four. Uh, this is the bottom one done uh, initially by a Japanese group. Now, each one of these hosts is doubly infected with either an A and B Wolbachia or multiple B strains, and they were either collected from natural populations or lab lines. And we could sequence the phage genes from each of these particular co-infections and ask, do they share the same exact phage, even though they're different Wolbachia? So in each case, you'll see we've drawn a line from the host to the phage sequence. This was done by another technician in the lab, Megan Chaffee. And in every case that we've tested thus far, there's exactly uh, 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 the same phage gene sequence from two different Wolbachia for all of these systems. Okay. So that's clear cut. We've only looked at one gene in those cases. So the next question became, 
is just one phage gene moving between these, or is it actually the whole phage genome that's traversing this intracellular region? So the way we're going to tackle that is we developed uh, the first time, I think, to actually use targeted sequence capture for sequencing symbiont genomes. And essentially, it works like this. So we're going to take our Nisonia wasps. We're going to have, obviously, Wolbachia DNA that we're targeting, which carries prophages. And then we have all the non-target DNA. We've got an array that has 80 base pair probes that are tiled on the array to capture only the Wolbachia genome, so that once we take the DNA homogenate and run it over the array, only the Wolbachia genome gets trapped. Then you will loot the Wolbachia DNA that's trapped on the probe, sequence that, and ask how well does that work. Now, prior, prior to us doing this, um, this had largely been used for resequencing of single genomes. It hadn't been applied to heterogeneous DNAs, let's say, in the environment, but also particularly in hosts, like these wasps with Wolbachia and all their other gut microbiota and viruses, etc. So how well does targeted genome capture work for uh, these complex systems? It works very well. So we were intending to target Wolbachia. We did. 98% of the nucleotides captured were annotated to Wolbachia. There's a little bit of Nisonia DNA, there's a little bit of other bacterial DNA, and then there's stuff that has no identity. So what is this? It turns out that the Nisonia DNA are, in fact, Wolbachia gene or genome inserts that jump from Wolbachia to the host insect. So the array is really good at also capturing genomic inserts from Wolbachia to eukaryotic genomes. The other bacteria stuff did tend to be 16S RNA conserved stuff that were just was just binding to the targets on the array, the probes on the array. And then the no identity stuff, um, well, it's no identity. Okay. So the next thing was to ask, was there a full genome transfer now that we have these Wolbachia sequences from both an A and a B Wolbachia? Now remember, these diverged 60 million years ago. They weren't previously known to have any DNA shared between them. When you look at the prophages, in the A Wolbachia, we have a 52.2 kilobase prophage, 51 genes, and all the genes are intact in coding. We also know that this is the phage that produces the lytic particles that I previously showed in the transmission electron micrographs, because it's the only phage that's intact. And we've sequenced the phage particles and can identify it back to this particular phage haplotype. Now, the key result here was Indeed, it looks like there's been a whole phage genome transfer between the A and B Wolbachia, um, and there's been a little bit of subsequent evolution after the transfer. You can see complete genome syntony. Um, you can also see that there are DNA losses, and so transposons have landed in these yellow boxes that have also knocked out genes uh, adjacent to them. This particular B Wolbachia is uh, lysogenic only. It's not known to produce active particles. And that probably makes sense given that some uh, head genes and tail genes are knocked out. So in terms of gene identity, um, if you look at the genes from those two uh, syntenic uh, prophage regions, uh, there's basically 99.9% .9 sequence identity for these two prophages between the A and B Wolbachia. If you compare that to other phage genes in these same A and B Wolbachia genomes, it's significantly higher. If you compare it to Wolbachia typing genes, MLST genes, it's also significantly higher. So our best conclusion here is that there's been a very recent transfer and also subsequent degeneration of these phages that have moved between the obligate intracellular bacteria. Okay, other evidence. Well, this isn't just about Wolbachia, as our model uh, alluded to. There could be facultative intracellular bacteria donating DNA into the obligate intracellular bacteria. So here's a case where that may have happened. Um, the bartonella Henseli genome actually came out at the same time the Wolbachia genome did. Both of these are alpha proteobacteria. This is an obligate intracellular bacteria from this large clade of anaplasma or lichia and rickettsia. Bartonella Henseli is a facultative intracellular bacteria. They both share a common host, the cat flea, which vectors cat scratch disease, which is actually Bartonella Henseli. And in their phage regions, they do share a significant number of genes that map back to phage woe. So this looks like another case of where co-infections, even between unrelated bacteria, can drive the phage exchange. 
it keeps going. So if you look at rickettsia plasmids, that a co so the rickettsia and Moldachia can co-occur in ticks. Um, if you look at one of the plasmids of these rickettsia, there's about a 10 kilobase region that shares significant homology with the same 10 kilobase region in the Wolbachia phage. So again, between different now obligate intracellular bacteria, we have shared DNA exchanging between mobile elements. So I think the first result that we can say here is animals are acting, at least these invertebrates are acting as incubators for genetic transfer of these bacteriophages and perhaps other mobile genetic elements in this intracellular arena. And we have evidence for facultative intracellular bacteria donating that, as well as exchange once that bacteria is in obligate intracellular bacteria. Much like a free-living bacteria, phages uh, in Wolbachia are also the most rapidly diverging parts of the genomes. So these, this is a comparative genomic hybridization analysis. Um, the reference genome is on the outside two circles. The five genomes that we used on the array are on the inside, labeled one through five. The prophage regions are labeled in pink. And you'll see where all the red slashes are and blue slashes indicating absent genes or divergent genes. They tend to cluster around the prophage. Um, this is a common feature in the free living world that also extends now into the symbiont world. So what's happening to these prophages? There's a significant amount of gene loss. So the phage genome looks to hold on to, in many cases, a full set of genes spanning uh, the head, the base plate, virulence, tail genes, but then there's a whole other fraction of these prophages that just dump the tail genes. So we presume that these are inactive phages. We don't know that yet. They could be commandeering tail proteins from co-occurring phages in the same genome, but for now we're looking at these as uh, essentially inactive phage particles versus active phage particles. Okay, so what happens to phage woe over 350,000 years of evolution? Uh, this is a case where we knew the divergence time of two Wolbachia and Drosophila both cause cytoplasmic incompatibility, which is actually a reproductive incompatibility, one of these reproductive parasitism phenotypes, where infected males cross to uninfected females gives you no offspring, um, and the self-cross is compatible, gives you uninfected offspring, and any crosses with infected females give you infected offspring. So one of the early uh, positions about phage woe is that it actually causes and may carry the genes that cause cytoplasmic incompatibility, which is one of the holy grails in the Wolbachia field. Part of the evidence for that that was ruled out initially is that the WREC genome from Drosophila recent, these mushroom-feeding flies, cause CI, but they appear to lack the phage. And that's been the primary source of genome loss over 350,000 years of evolution. So some of us would argue initially that the phage cannot be responsible for causing CI because of all the gene loss that's going on here. So it, it really took us to sequence the <coughs> uh, WREC genome to figure out that that hypothesis probably is still in play. The phage could be vectoring these genes that cause CI just because not the entire phage has been lost. So in orange are the genes that have been lost, and in blue are the phage genes that have still been retained. So there's a large number of phage genes in blue that are still retained inside the WREC Drosophila uh, Wolbachia genome. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's our general model for just thinking about phages in the free living world versus the obligate intracellular world based on our evidence to date. Uh, in the free living world, phages are known to undergo a significant amount of recombination, mosaicism. So different phage types can come together and undergo recombination and share blocks or modules of genes. In the obligate intracellular world, we see something a little bit more constrained. Wolbachia can harbor their own phage elements, but they tend to be recombining only with those other phage elements because there's not a vast gene pool of phages for it to get mixed up like here. In addition, the phages undergo some amount of genome degradation, um, knockouts, by transposon insertions and phage shrinkage or genome loss, which is a typical mechanism of endosymbiont genome evolution. We see genome degradation all over 
endosymbiont genomes. And to some degree, we're seeing it in the phage genomes as well. So a more confined niche uh, to a more open permissive niche changes the genetics. So part one summary thus far. Um, Wolbachia well, is an obligate intracellular bacteria. It co-occurs with other obligate intracellular bacteria where there may be exchange. There's also facultative intracellular bacteria that come and go and can source some of this novel information. In addition, the WAS system we've studied has produced the largest gene transfer event to date with phage WO transferring between the A Wolbachia and the B Wolbachia. It's about a 50 kilobase transfer. And then finally, we've developed this targeted genome capture to look at infections in a heterogeneous environment, and that works really well. Okay, part two now gets back to the original question of how does phage woe still do this? How does it actually traverse the twofold cell challenge? Because we now know we've got movement, we now know we have phages dispersing into the eukaryotic environment. What's the trick for how it accomplishes this? Okay, so we've turned to sequencing the phage particle genomes. Um, everything we knew about the phage thus far suggested this is a canonical bacteriophage. Um, head genes, base plate genes, tail genes. And this is what we were able to sequence from some of the phage particles from Nasonia. What we added on, though, with our sequencing effort was a formerly annotated part of the Wolbachia genome that was considered Wolbachia genes is actually part of the bacteriophage particle genomes. And you'll notice some of the sizes of these genes are rather large. Uh, they're huge. They, they're almost of the size of a eukaryotic gene. And we at first didn't believe that this was part of the phage, given the dogma thus far. So what we did is we went ahead and confirmed that these are, in fact, packaged in particles in separate experiments by identifying the ATTL and TTR sites, uh, PCRing across the ATTP sites where the phage genome circularizes, and ultimately getting the PCR product, sequencing that PCR product to confirm this is indeed the ATTP site. So we can do this now for the phages of Nasonia. We've also done it for a couple other phages in which we've sequenced the genomes and we're able to piece together the story. And in each case, we start seeing very large genes that, again, are eukaryotic in length. And I'm going to explain to you why we call this the eukaryotic association module, or EAM. This is a common feature of phage woe. If you go back and start reanalyzing the prophage genomes in Wolbachia, about 50% of the genome is a core phage genome. The other 50% of the genome is EAM genes. Uh, this is definitely part of phage woe biology. So what are in these genes? I've shown them to you thus far as a big red blob in some cases. The red stands for an anchor and repeat protein. If you know anything about anchor and repeats, they're uh, repetitive amino acid motifs typically used in eukaryotes uh, for a variety of processes. We now see that these eukaryotic anchor and repeats are common in the phage genome. Again, this becomes part of the story for why we call this a eukaryotic association module. If you do uh, a general blast search, uh, you'll start to see that some of the features of the anchor and repeat proteins actually lump into specific sections of, the, of, the, of those particular genes. So this is a 5,000 amino acid gene that appears to have homology to some things in some portions and different things in other portions. This allowed us to actually annotate protein domains at a finer level and figure out what actually is this gene that was previously annotated as an anchor and repeat protein. And we start finding other domains that are eukaryotic association domains. I'll tell you a little bit more in a second. Um, we're also going to show you some comparative protein architecture analyses. And finally, we're going to do some phylogenetic analyses based on reciprocal best blast to infer the ancestry of these protein domains. So the most exciting one to talk about is, is this. And then you guys can fall asleep afterwards. Um, so this is what it looks like. This is a black widow. The black widow produces a neurotoxin called the latrotoxin. The latrotoxin is classically used to cause the pain in the recipients of the bites. And in the black widow uh, latrotoxin is this orange C-terminal domain. Um, it's in both uh, alpha latrotoxins and delta, delta latro insectotoxins. If you look at phage woe's genome, 
doesn't look a lot like that, with the exception of this orange sea terminal domain, which is homologous to the uh, black widow spider alpha-lactotoxin. And that domain has been lumped onto or lumped in with very large genes, sometimes small genes, with diverse protein functions uh, that we can talk a little bit more about in a second. Some of these just come up as pure anchorins. Other functional domains are uh, more diverse. So how do we know this is uh, potentially shared homology versus convergence? Well, actually, before I do that, just want to emphasize that part of the activity of the latrotoxin, it has to be cleaved by a eukaryotic uh, 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 furin cleavage. And so they have sites in the, in the sequences, the protein sequences for eukaryotic furin cleavage. Those sites are also in the Wolbachia genes that harbor the C-terminal domain and also are similarly positioned often right near the C-terminal domain for some of these genes. Um, the C-terminal domain in, a, in, in the black widows is produced by secretory cells. Um, and the C-terminal domain in particular is hypothesized to facilitate disintegration of secretory cells. So it's breaking down, presumably, its own eukaryotic cells to be released uh, into the victim. Uh, the victim's furin-mediated cleavage removes the C-terminal domain, activates the toxin, uh, then the anchored repeats come in, uh, lodge themselves into membranes, open up pores, and this causes a massive release of calcium influx and transmitter release. So that's what the C-terminal domain does. This is why we think it's relevant, because if you do reciprocal blast searches, you only find that the phage woe and the black widow spiders, plus one rickettsia up here, which we can just forget about, um, has, is what you see in the databases, nothing else. And we know that Wolbachia occurs in spiders, sometimes black widows. We also know that uh, there are invertebrate-specific latrotoxins and vertebrate-specific toxins. And the invertebrate-specific toxins are more closely related to the Wolbachia and phage haplotypes than the vertebrate ones, which would make sense if these are acting how we might think they act as anti-eukaryotic uh, uh, um, cell busters, essentially, part of the lysis mechanism for phages in this niche. So this is not the only story. There's a whole, sh there's a whole lot of this going on. I'm not going to tell you every case because I bore you. Here's just one more case of a knock domain. Um, in eukaryotes, knock domains are found in pathogen sensing and apoptosis proteins. If we do the comparative protein architecture, um, these are a couple of genes in Wolbachia that have the knock domain in blue. Um, these are eukaryotes that have the knock domain as well. There's a common shared portion of those domains that maps back to Wolbachia. If you put that shared portion into a reciprocal blast search and do a phylogeny, this is what you see. Um, the phage woe knock domain just kind of sits right out of this lineage with Culex kinkae fisciatus, the eukaryotic uh, host, which is a common host for Wolbachia. So it looks like there's been ex an exchange from arthropod infected hosts to the phage woe. Now we don't know the direction of that. I will caution that we don't know the direction. And we don't know if there are initial or intermediate steps, but ultimately we land upon these relationships. This is a comprehensive database search where only phage woe and uh, eukaryotes have these particular domains. Okay, so to the best of our knowledge, uh, this is a, another first for a eukaryotic knock domain in a bacteriophage, uh, similar to the latrotoxin. It shares a last common ancestor with arthropod hosts, in this case mosquitoes. Um, and its role in sacrificial cell death in animals is well established and potentially implicates this protein or, or peptide as a WO lysis candidate of host cells. So if you do the whole sort of analysis, it's really a smorgasbord of chimerism between metazoans, bacterial genes, and phage genes. What we're showing here are phage genes with their protein architecture, and then we're drawing homology to the uh, most recent common ancestor outside of the phage or Wolbachia. Um, we see things like Sumulation protein domains derived from other bacteria. We see innate immunity genes derived from hydra. We see uh, sumulation genes and ubiquination genes derived from other bacteria. Pathogen sensing stuff, cell lysis, and the list goes on and on. So but the bottom line is, is we don't functionally know the answer yet, but this is the first time in virology that we're aware of that if you look at this model and you ask how does the virus do it, 
it looks like it's doing it through this. So we're going to add another arrow lateral transfer between the host DNA and ultimately the bacteriophage DNA. Uh, first time that a lot of these eukaryotic genes or domains have been found in a bacteriophage. This is a, a list of the, of the stuff we're finding. It's not just black widow toxins. We're finding bacterial uh, insecticidal toxins, um, prank domains from viruses, ANC enrichments. We talked about that. Sumo proteases, a um, lot of good stuff in here. So the model for comparisons between the free living phages and the symbiont phages, uh, we're just kind of speculating here, but I think we need to add, at least for Wolbachia, another component, which is most of the variation in these genomes actually ends up being in the eukaryotic association module part of these, gene, of these prophages, right? So kind of like what's happening in the free living world between different phages, we're actually seeing that kind of mosaicism being acquired from the host nucleus for Wolbachia's primary host. And that's where the variation shows up. OK. In terms of gene exchange, I'm going to tell you one story, uh, if I have the time, it looks like I do, about uh, what we also found by looking at phage woe's lysozyme. The lysozyme in phage woe uh, encodes a GH25 neuramidase, which lyses peptidoglycan. When we blasted phage woe's lysozyme, we end up finding homo homologs across the tree of life in archaea, as well as diverse types of eukaryotes, including selaginella plants, various types of fungi, and aphids. And that GH25 meramidase has been co-opted un uh, in unique ways into each of these systems. So here it is here with four other protein domains that are probably, or three other protein domains that are antibacterial. There's a Drosophila flying around. Probably has Wolbachia in it. So uh, GH25 meramidases have been duplicated in the plant genome that we've studied um, and other cases here. So what was interesting to us is if you take all of these GH25 meramidases and put them on a massive phylogenetic tree, we have about 90 sequences here. The backbone of the tree is bacterial. It's, that's what's labeled in black, right? all these bacteria. Uh, phage woe is phage woe? right around here. Okay. But all the color coding, so blue for aphid, orange for fungi, green for plants, you can see that this GH25 meramidase has moved around the bacterial world, but also from the bacterial world to various types of non-bacterial taxa. This is all based on reciprocal best blast hits. If you zoom in on certain parts of the tree and remake the tree, we reconfirm those relationships of bacteria donating this lysozyme gene or domain into the non-bacterial world. And this became interesting to us uh, because if you look at the conserved amino acid sites across this particular domain, those conserved amino acid sites are right in the beta barrel pocket where the catalytic residues are, which, which suggests perhaps, based, and this is all based on three-dimensional prediction, not actual structures, but it suggests that the antibacterial capacity for this lysozyme may have been conserved in these recipient taxa. So this is seen, shown here for the archaea, abunii, and for the plant, but also it's the same story for the other non-bacterial taxa. So our goal then was to test if this actually has antibacterial capacity to prove that this widespread gene transfer event is functional. So clone, express, purify, and then test if there's any antibacterial capacity. So uh, first result that's kind of interesting is if you clone up E. coli with the entire lysozyme from the archaea, it has four domains, remember. Those E. coli, they're not even expressing E. coli. They just carry the DNA uh, clone gene. Those E. coli die. without. So there has to be some kind of leaky expression that's probably killing those cells. And we did get a few cells to grow up that, when sequenced, had an IS-1 transposase landed right in it and knocking out the coding capacity of these particular full-length lysozymes. So this indicates that it's not the construct itself that's causing the death, but probably some kind of leaky expression, very leaky, as there was no expression intended in these particular clones. So we abandoned this because it appeared to be too toxic to E. coli and just focused on cloning and expressing only the GH25 meramidase. When we do that and then inoculate it onto various types of bacteria, um, 
You'll see in the red column here, this is the A. bunii GH25 meraminase peptide. Um, now it's inoculated onto various types of bacteria in the firmicutes, and it has the strongest killing capacity of all the other enzymes that we tested, including a chicken egg white lysozyme. That's a classic antibacterial uh, peptide from, from chickens. The activity is dose-dependent, oops, dose-dependent as we expect. Um, we talked with Eric about Panabacillus a little bit. Uh, here are the two species that we know it kills. So ultimately, this is uh, the first antibacterial gene described in Archaea, and uh, we think it may open up prospects for looking for other antibacterial products in this domain of life. Okay, so let's wrap up. Uh, how important are phages in the obligate intracellular world? Um, I hope I've illuminated somewhat uh, that there's a story here that's not to be ignored. Uh, we know that there are phages in Wolbachia. There are also phages in Chlamydia, shown here, attached on the outside. And there are even ancient phage genes uh, that are associated with mitochondria and chloroplasts that are involved in transcription and replication apparatus. Um, our story is basically the phage woe transfers between Wolbachia co-infections at a very high rate. We also have the largest horizontal gene transfer event in obligate intracellular bacteria through these phages. Phage woe has a novel hybrid genome. I'm going to use that loosely in quotes because it's mosaic derived from horizontal gene transfer with arthropods. Think about phage woe's evolution as akin to an evolution of a eukaryotic virus that picks up eukaryotic genes in order to do its own business as well. It's kind of a similar life history strategy for viruses in the eukaryotic niche, now extended to phages. Um, this is a, a new process in virology. And uh, lastly, we've got the first case of lysozyme gene transfer across the tree of life, and it's the first antibiotic gene in archaea. OK, so I've highlighted uh, some of the folks that contributed to this work along the way. Uh, Jason is a former MD-PhD student. Sarah, my wife, is the senior specialist in the lab. Bethany, a former postdoc. Uh, Megan and Michelle, former technicians. And Lisa Funkhaus are a current graduate student in the lab. Um, thank you for your patience. And uh, if I can answer any questions, let's do it. Thank you, guys. Of course, yes, yes. There's tons of horizontal gene transfer going on, right? This certainly isn't the, the only case. So if you want to take on that fight, uh, <laughs> go for it. Um, yeah. Yeah? I never heard about the Wolbachia being the inflammatory agent in diseases. I'm really curious about the interaction between Wolbachia and the worms. Okay. And is it actually, are the worms getting any? That's a good question. I, I think the current hypothesis on why the Wolbachia release from the worms is a natural shedding process. So the hypodermis is sort of like an external layer, and those cells may be regenerating and pumping off Wolbachia as they're, as they're lost and sloshed off, essentially. That's all I've heard about. I've never heard about a functional um, perspective on why the worms are doing that. All the functional stuff relates to Wolbachia is required for oogenesis, Wolbachia is required for larval development, etc. Why they're in the hypodermis? You know, one could make some speculations here that they're in the hypodermis to aid the worm fitness. I guess because the worms are essentially using Wolbachia as a cloaking mechanism. It's the Trojan horse per perfection, right? So go send the host immune system to detect bacteria and not the worm, so the worm sits cozy. And maybe that is the functional story that I don't know how you test that. It's sort of a just-so story, but it's, it's attractive. Does that work? Okay. Yeah? This might be a dumb question. But how challenging is it that the first generation or two of genome projects and, NC, and filling up NCBI, a lot of those insect tissues may have been contaminated with Wolbachia. So when you look for horizontal gene transfer, you find it everywhere because the big few like genome is, you know, those kind of specimens that we didn't really know that. Yeah, so initially what they would do, 
uh, is when insect genomes were sequenced, they'd put all reads to Wolbachia in a bin and not include that in annotation of those genomes. Then people revisited that data and were able to show actually those are real genomic inserts of Wolbachia in the host genome. They did fish labeling or some kind of immunofluorescence labeling to show that the genes are in fact in the chromosomes of the insects. Uh, and have estimated now that at least 40% of the insect genome sequenced have some kind of Wolbachia DNA, either single genes or full genomes. It's, uh, yeah, it's amazing, right? So this, this, this gene transfer stuff is happening all the time from bacteria, particularly Wolbachia, to their invertebrate hosts. And, um, and now it's just part of the normal biology. So we do have to be careful, though, that annotation doesn't include extra genomic sort of cytoplasmic Wolbachia genomes into an annotation of the eukaryotic genome, which could happen aberrantly. And so when we do see genomic inserts, it's always good to confirm them with some kind of microscopy. Jose? You know, we filter for chimeras, right? So how that, the whole process works? You know, you see the chimeras, you take them out. Now, how you bring them, I mean... Yeah. In this case, the chimera may be biologically real. So I think if we see a chimera between Wolbachia and the host, you microscopically you use microscopy to confirm it. If you can't confirm it, then you've got a case where you probably had an aberrant uh, genome annotation and or genome assembly and just and dump it back out. Um, that's the best way that I can think of handling it. And that is pretty routine now in the field when people are reporting Wolbachia genomic inserts. At least in the Wolbachia field, they're doing that. In the insect world, I don't think they're doing that. I think they're just putting genomes out there that may have false annotations in them. And I don't know what to ask of those folks because they're clearly not going to go and confirm these things and they're just dumping their assemblies into the database. So this could be a, now I'm appreciating the questions here, it could be actually a more prolific problem outside of the Wolbachia field. Yeah. So you described um, basically double-stranded DNA temperate phages for Wolbachia. In the pre-living phage world, there are single-stranded phages, virulent phages, Think those exist in the intracellular phage world? Yeah, so chlamydia has a single stranded DNA phage. And that's all I know about phages in the obligate intracellular bacterial world, in the extant world right now. I've never seen anything else. Uh, maybe somebody else knows something. There are plasmids in phytoplasma or plasmid phage combinations in phytoplasma. Uh, but in terms of canonical bacteriophages, we've got Wolbachia, and we've got a single strand of DNA phage in chlamydia. And the, I guess the question for us would be, is that the tip of the iceberg, or are these just really sort of freak events and we stop there? The common theme, though, is chlamydia and Wolbachia are some of the most common obligate intracellular bacteria on the planet. So if you'd like to speculate here, you could say, well, if you get common enough in nature, you're going to get attacked by selfish elements like phages. And so perhaps the most common... Uh, obligate intracellular bacteria will show this as a, co a, a more common feature. Eric? Right. This goes off a little bit, but a lot of the work on Wolbachia and from your lab and others. What are some of the other intracellular symbionts that could be important in the insect world that maybe haven't been studied as well? Are there others? Four phages? Uh, uh, no, just other obligate intracellular bacterial awesome. symbionts and uh, where this kind of work could use some attention. Yeah. So there's been a lot of work in vertically transmitted, strictly vertically transmitted mutualistic obligate intracellular bacteria. These tend to be the nutritional endosymbionts of aphids or other kinds of insects. You might have heard of Buchnera or Wigglesworthia, um, Hodgkinia. And these show extreme genome degradation and no evidence of mobile genetic elements. Just, they're just clean genomes. And I, to me, that suggests it fits within a model that if you're vertically transmitted, always, you're going to have a, this sort of genome deterioration. If you're horizontally transmitted, like Wolbachia or Chlamydia, and you're common enough, you might be prone to picking up novel mobile elements because you're moving around enough, you're exposing yourself to those gene pools. Um, so in a general sense, th those are the predictions. Um, it's estimated that 
40% of all arthropod species harbor Wolbachia. It's estimated that 10% of all arthropod species have nutritional endosymbiotic bacteria. And so there is an amalgam of possibilities to, to look at. Um, and uh, I think I'll, that's sort of the extent of my bandwidth for how to answer that. That's great. Yeah. So Eric, December 7th, Nancy Moran will give you Yeah. So she'll give you the, the clean genome story. Um, and now you've heard the sort of dirty genome story. Really depends on transmission style. Yeah. You just referred to Wolbachia as horizontally transmitted. Yeah. You showed a beautiful slide of the egg with Wolbachia in the egg showing vertical transmission. So, so. Right. My bad. So it's a mix of both, and I haven't been clear about that. So Wolbachia are primarily vertically transmitted, um, but on an evolutionary time scale, they appear to go horizontal transfer at a frequent enough rate that we get these co-infections that in turn facilitate the phage exchange. Right. We don't know how that horizontal transfer is happening. We, there's perhaps a parasitoid host exchange thing going on, a predator-prey interaction, perhaps bringing in infected insects and uninfected predators. But that's about the extent that we, we know how it does that. Yeah. yeah. Any idea where we'd stop Wolbachia from being able to take over? In a system, so Mike Wade's lab spent years trying to get some cloning species to take up Wolbachia. He'd inject them into the embryos and it never took. Okay, so there's a, and I, I know Mike Wade's work is really good, and he's got a lot of fun stuff, even on Wolbachia, where they occur naturally in some tribolium. The short answer, though, is there's, a, there's another way to do it. If you inject into an abdomen of an insect, and this has been done in Drosophila. The Wolbachia can migrate in the hemolymph and ultimately find the germline stem cell niche of the ovaries. And after about three or four weeks, it colonizes that niche and passes itself on. So instead of doing the hard work of trying to get a viable egg, which is what we all did back then, you can now just put it in the abdomen and that tends to have higher survival and then you wait. And it appears to occur at a high rate. Yeah. Okay, thanks everybody. Appreciate it.